Hi all, so I'm going to talk about some work I did this year and published with James Owen and in, in MNRAS, the archive numbers up here. Okay, so we got interested in this, uh, this result here, um, which was originally published by Jorge Melendez in 2009. So by looking at the, uh, the composition of um, the sun in comparison to uh, the average of solar twin stars, so these are stars with very similar effective temperatures, metallicities, ages, etc., to the sun, he uh, managed to identify essentially a, a trend in the, the difference between that, the, the abundance of the typical solar twin and the sun um, of various different uh, atomic species um, against condensation temperature. So the condensation temperature here is a temperature at which um, uh, uh, material would uh, go from being in the gas phase to being solid, such as in ices or being locked up in grains. So this result here is, you know, suggesting that somehow there's rocky material missing from the um, from the surface of the, the sun compared to um, essentially the average star, the average sun-like star. Um, so more recently, this work has been followed up with, by Megan Bedell, who essentially sees a, a similar thing that uh, refractory elements appear to be missing from, from the sun. So after the original result came out, John Chambers showed that you could more or less explain this trend if you argue that the, the sun is missing, for example, two Earth masses of uh, um, Earth-like material and two Earth masses of uh, chondrite-like material. So this is sort of a, an interesting argument that maybe uh, the surface of the sun is um, is missing rockery material. Maybe that lot was locked up into planets. Um, more recent analysis of the Bedell results just maybe the number slightly lower than four Earth masses. It's more like two Earth masses, but still, um, you know, it's an interesting result. Perhaps this is due to uh, the locking up of refractory material. Um, and the most commonly accepted or the most uh, popular idea or a popular idea for this has definitely been um, whether this uh, can be explained by the formation of the rocky planets in the solar system. But essentially, we now know enough about exoplanets that we can compare you know, these results to what we know about exoplanets and see whether this is really a, 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 reasonable, a reasonable thing. And this is one of the things we've done. Um, so it's important to realize that these numbers, this um, two Earth masses or four, four Earth masses, come from considering the sun's convection zone today. So essentially, you're seeing the the, the material that's missing from the, the outer two and a half percent of the, uh, the sun as it is today. But when the sun was much younger, while with the protoplanetary disk was around, it was typically fully convective. Um, so it's potential that actually much more mass is potentially possible that much more mass is missing from the sun up to maybe 150 Earth masses or, or something like that. If, uh, you know, essentially the, the rocky material was mi missing during formation. Um, so to test this, what we've done is we've taken uh, our model of protoplanetary disks, which is a viscous model plus photo evaporation to do disk dispersing. And on top of that, we've added, uh, you know, standard treatment of dust evolution from the two population model of uh, Tilburn steel. These models do a pretty good job of explaining, for example, the fraction of disks as, uh, in clusters of different ages. James Owen showed that in 2011. And recently with Andrew Salop, we showed that they actually do a reasonable, good, reasonable job of matching the, uh, the millimeter fluxes and accretion rates of disks in regions uh, of different ages. So lupus here is a relatively young region of three million years and also in Upper SCO, the models were you know, five to eight million years. So we think we're on more or less the right track here with understanding you know, how the accretion onto the star and the dust masses are evolving in the disks. So essentially we use these models to get the accretion rate uh, onto the stars, which we then couple to a model of the solar convection zone to work out what the abundances at the stellar surface are. And um, we can use that to essentially, you know, test different hypotheses about where the rocky material has gone. Um, so what I'm showing here quickly is the uh, accretion rate as a function of time of the gas in models uh, with two different photo evaporation rates. Essentially, the accretion rate goes down over time until it's eventually shut off by photo evaporation. Yeah. The dust behaves a little bit differently. The growth of dust leads to initially increasing accretion rate. And then as the dust to gas ratio drops in the models, the, the accretion rate of dust um, decreases. 
Um, so you can think that the stars uh, relative to the, the initial disk composition are going to get slightly enriched in dust initially and then over time that enrichment is going to, you know, they're going to essentially be less enriched as more and more gas is accreted on. Um, okay, we also varied this parameter f bro, which is a factor that's reducing the growth time scale because today we don't really observationally know just how quickly the dust evolves. Uh, it doesn't really change um, the behavior phenomenologically. Um, great. So the first thing we did is ask the question, can you know, rocky planets or super Earths be responsible for explaining that depletion seen in the solar twins? So we took the MACE model for the convection zone as a function of time, and we took the disk evolution model, and we also took um, uh, you know, our best knowledge of what the distribution of rocky exoplanets is today, um, which we think is this work by John Zink, who um, he essentially measured the multiplicity and the radii distribution of um, planets in the Kepler data, taking into account a, a bias that's not been treated before, which is the fact that second, third, subsequent planets are harder to detect than the first one um, due to essentially the way the Kepler analysis is done. So this is one of the, uh, the distributions that would give, you know, should give you the, the largest number of planets uh, in, in, the Kep in a given Kepler system. And that's what is found here. So we took these radii from, from this work of John Zink and used the, the forecaster model of uh, Chen and Kipping to convert these um, to convert these radii into masses and then constructed planetary systems of synthetic masses that agree with these distributions. Okay, so um, what we see on the left is the um, the probability of a system to, exit, to uh, uh, exceed a given mass. Um, um, in the middle, we're showing the depletion for these systems compared to the depletion with no planet. And on the right, we're showing the probability distribution of, of depletions. So we made two assumptions for the model. Either all of the planets in the same system have uh, independent masses or they're identical, which is two extremes of the, the possibilities. Um, but independent of these, you, you come to the conclusion that the, the depletion of the average um, uh, of, a, of a solar twin from uh, a typical exoplanetary system with super Earths should be higher than the sun, not lower, as we see. And even though it should be higher, the depletion should also be typically considerably lower than um, what the depletion we see in the sun is. So here is the sort of the, an estimate of the a probability of the depletion you see in the sun. Um, so very few planetary systems should be able to produce that level of depletion. So the conclusion from that is essentially that it's very difficult to explain uh, the depletion we see in the sun as due to forming the Earth and Venus. It just does, it, it sort of doesn't make sense, right? So what we think is a better idea is, is the role of Jupiter. So we know today, especially from uh, work that's come out from ALMA in the last few years since HL Thor that, you know, protoplanetary disks with gaps and rings are common. And here is sort of the poster child. It's, um, it's PDS-70b where we know there's a planet forming a gap and creating this big ring. Um, we know that transition disks tend to be more massive. They definitely, than, than disks on average, they're definitely trapping dust. So we believe that, you know, this is a, a potentially interesting channel for forming the, the solar twins. So if we take uh, models, of our disk evolution and add a planet into them, which we've done at about half a million years here, the planet stops the dust accreting onto the star, but the gas continues to accrete. Right? So that means that the, the systems with giant planets are gonna be depleted with respect to systems without giant planets. Um, so here we're showing the evolution of a, a system without a giant planet. And you can see, you know, the, the, dust, is, the dust density in the inner region is higher than the previous case as time goes on in accretion. Um, of dust continues all the way up until uh, photo evaporation kicks in in a second, and that's going to truncate both the accretion of dust and gas. Whereas in the case of the planet, the gas accretion is going on again, but the accretion of dust ends pretty soon after the planet opens up the gap. Okay, so I'll just let this finish so that you can see the, um, the depletion due to photo evaporation, which is now happening about 10 to 11 megaminutes. Okay, so if we show that again in the accretion rate as a function of time, space, the left hand 
plot is the one you've seen before. And the right-hand one is now the case for the planet. And you can see in this region that uh, once you inject a planet, the accretion rate of dust drops off very rapidly. And um, that's a, a little bit sensitive to the growth rate. If you make the dust grain small, the inner disk takes a bit longer uh, to drain, but it, it's always the case that the planet eventually causes the, uh, the depletion of, of dust accreting onto the star. So if we do this, uh, we compute the metallicity of the, the star's um, atmosphere first uh, without, a, uh, without a planet. Um, the early accretion of, of, gap, of uh, solids initially enriches the, the planet's metallicity, um, which, uh, and then eventually the accretion of gas, uh, of, uh, you know, gas and low dust to gas ratios at late times can lead to uh, you know, that, that value going down a little bit too. Um, so then if we compare that, uh, if we then take the difference of this to the case of the planet, uh, we get what's in the bottom panels here for their values with um, uh, different ranges of the X-ray luminosity. Um, so we see in this middle panel with the, um, uh, that uh, um, we don't really have any difficulties producing um, uh, depletions in the required range, which is sort of this 0.02 to 0.04 dex, as long as the, the growth of dust isn't too fast. If it's too fast, then by the time the planet's formed, all of the dust has drifted onto the star. Um, uh, and, you know, you don't, you essentially don't get any impact of, of the planet. If it's too slow, then you don't get such a big effect because the ability of the because the enrichment of the star in the no planet case is smaller. But in this sort of more intermediate case, you get um, uh, sufficient er enrichment of the star initially, and there's enough dust left in the disk that the planet can form a nice massive transition disk. And that trapping of dust can lead to significant depletions of the star in that right range. So leaving it there and putting up my conclusions, uh, we say that um, and we think that essentially the formation of transition disks in in protoplanetary disks is the origin of the the origin of the sun's uh, depletion of refractory or dust forming elements compared to the average solar trend. 